So the City is a Reformist project that starts in the 1970s plan of Bologna. This presentation looks at the city as a reformist project, uh, where the word reformist uh, is to be intended as a political approach uh, that refuses conservative policies, of course, but also does not believe in the revolution uh, per se. Differently, it looks at the opportunity to work on the institutions in order to implement a series of reforms able to change the political, social and economic system. This presentation will analyze precisely. It's not. The presentation will analyze precisely the case studies of the 1960s reforms that took place in Bologna as a reformist project that tries to discard the model of society focused on the individualism imposed by the system in the 1950s and perceived as natural in favor of an understanding of human sociality defined by collective consciousness. We will see that in this ambitious and quite revolutionary project, town planning has an essential role. The focus will be the 1973 Low Income Housing Plan for the Historical Center of Bologna and the typological research that defines it. The plan for the Historical Center of Bologna is to be inscribed in the bigger, within the bigger debate ongoing in the 1950s and 1960s on the Historical Center. The main question of the debate arose as a consequence of city expansion resulting from the industrialization process of the 19th century and focused on what to do with historical centers, likely located at the very core of the metropolitan system. The main options were to keep them as they are and turn them in touristic areas, or to destroy them, or at least part of them, in order to make room to the new form and the needs of the modern city. Obviously, this question became even more important and urgent after the bombing of the Second World War. Among the different approaches debated, the plan of Bologna proposed an alternative one, rejecting, the tour, uh, rejecting to turn the historic center into a museum, as well as refusing the gentrification process that would have resulted from its turn into the center of the metropolitan system. Differently, the plan proposed a restoration of the historic center, but at the same time, its social conservation. In doing so, it suggests an understanding of typology as an urban tool that expresses an interesting link between form, function, and social classes. The essential role that the concept of typology has in this plan, of course, to put in resonance with all those theories that we all know really well by now, I guess. In this case, bringing to the forefront the very political and urban rather than architectural role of the concept. So Bologna. Bologna is a city characterized by a dense historical center and a 20th century radial and scatter expansion. This is Bologna at the beginning of the 19th century. We can see that uh, in terms of structure, the core of the historical center of the city preserves the grid system of the roads uh, set out to the Roman and Byzantine periods. Uh, it is the one, uh, okay, I don't have the pointer, but it is the very, very core of the historical center. And then the radial system of the Roman suburban roads, uh, all enclosed in the wall of, within the wall of the city. This is Bologna in the um, beginning of the uh, 20th century, in half of the 20th century, 1940, with a population of uh, 281,000. The city embarked on, the, in, on an expansion outside the last wall that was turned in the boulevard ring, and that we see in red in this map. We can see clearly the industrial area in the north, two bourgeois garden neighborhoods located at the bottom of the east and west southern hills, while the workers uh, settled themselves uh, close to the northern train station and along the Via Emilia, the cuts this map uh, in an horizontal way. After the Second World War, the 1955 plan was designed to accommodate uh, one million person city. That meant turning from agricultural into buildable, buildable areas a vast amount of land. Here we can see how all the orange areas mapped in the sky were dedicated to high density housing, and in yellow, the one dedicated to low density housing. As regards the historical center, the plan um, 
yeah, the, the plants and a lot of the, the instruments of the historical center that are the one marked in, in red, that are actually the action of like really changing the, uh, the urban form of the historical center into, in order to accommodate uh, new functions and new, uh, and new needs. And uh, while the act of preservation, the broader act of, of preservation, is limited to uh, only to the monuments that are the one in uh, brown, purple in this map. So we arrive in the 1960s uh, when Bologna and the entire Antilia Romagna region uh, have been ruled by the, the Italian Communist Party. And the Italian Pro Communist Party proposed a big change in city management that focused on public investment policies with the objective of redistributing income in favor of the working class through the implementation of services and social investments. The city was the first in Italy to be split into 15 neighborhoods. Each area of the city was provided with a borough council, which was able to challenge community interaction and was equipped with an excellent network of social services, including public kindergartens and public libraries. In Italy, it was really the first city that uh, really hosted this kind of uh, services. The 1,000, uh, one, uh, 1 million people inhabitant city plan was still in effect in the 1960s when Giuseppe Campos Benuti became chief of the urban planning department. Despite the city was counted barely 840,000 inhabitants and little prospect of total population growth. Campos Benuti deeply criticized the former plan. Uh, it, was, it was part of this administration of very committed uh, uh, I would say politician, but, but also technician, because right, it was really a team of very high quality, a very high level of uh, politician and uh, technicians really committed to the, to the mission, let's say, to the political uh, change. Um, so Campos Minuti criticized uh, deeply the former plan and read, uh, uh, that he read as supporting real estate speculation. And on the contrary, he targeted the commodification of land as the worst damage for the entire community, the entire city. His urban reforms that will later be called Urbanistica Reformista consisted in drawing a set of policies whose aim was to redistribute land, contrast, contrast the land value increase and what today we would call the gentrification of the historical center and therefore stop land uh, speculation. He strongly believed that to stop real estate speculation and in general this trend meant to put the administration in the position to control the urban transformation. He applied this concept at different scale. The outskirts of the city had to be planned in accordance to the entire region and the most important of these interventions were uh, those that focus on the decentralization of the area de dedicated to service sectors, giving rise to the center gross that is still one of the most important in Italian log logistic center and the new Fiera district. The new buildable areas uh, uh, of the city, like in, internally of the uh, in the city territory, uh, and, and, and that were those representing the main target of the land speculation, were completely redesigned to host both industrial and low income housing complexes. And this was achieved through uh, a large scale, uh, a large scale expropriation of the majority of the buildable areas uh, located uh, close to the city center, and, they can, they, and then uh, that then will um, will be uh, were turned into housing complexes managed and built by uh, the state. Lastly, the historical center what Campos Benuti defined as the core of the land values increase uh, process. With this team, they uh, studied uh, um, the phenomenon of uh, uh, the metropolitan development and how this, uh, let's say, process was uh, sick somehow. They defined they define this process as defined as a uh, uh, few main stages. The first one is uh, the expansion of the city that results from the industrialization process. This expansion generates an increase in the value of the central areas better serviced than the peripheries, but laying in a state of neglect, which prompts owners and investors' interest in the regeneration of central areas that many times translate in the demolition and reconstruction of parts of the central city in order to rent it at a higher prices, which means, of course, uh, uh, removing uh, local inhabitants. Therefore, the subsequent need of housing for the latter, 
that result in the further expansion of the city, this time most likely as a real estate investment that in turn contribute to the increase of the value of the city center and so on. I am sorry for, I mean, because the presentation changed the font of the character, I don't know why, so there are a bit of overlaps, but I think we can, <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> ah. This is how the administration defined the historical center as the core of land value increase process. And they identified this passage as the most critical one. In order to stop this process, in order to prevent, to, to avoid the gentrification of the, uh, of the historical center, a policy was required that would, uh, that would regenerate the historical center, pre preserving the physical, social, and economic structure of the specific central area. This ambitious project was formulated in the form of a plan drawn by the architect Pierluigi Cervellati, the Piano Urbanistico di Risanamento e Restauro del Centro Storico, that then turned in the Piano per l'Edilizia Economica e Popolare, a low income housing project directed specifically at the historical center. The process that led to the production of, the, uh, of these plans uh, was based on four different contributions, all commissioned by the Council. The relazione dell'indagine settoriale sul centro storico di Bologna, a research developed by Leonardo Benevolo in, in 1965, a photographic survey, as well as socioeconomic analysis, and an extensive typological research. And now I will describe each one of these contributions. So the relazione dell'indagine settoriale sul centro storico di Bologna was uh, this uh, research that was commissioned by uh, the Council of Bologna in 1962 to the University of Florence, since the University of Bologna didn't have an architectural faculty uh, back then, and uh, um, was, uh, was a research led by Leonardo Benevolo and a group of uh, researchers. I think we were like seven, between seven and ten researchers. The report highlighted what's super interesting about these researches is the report highlighted a clash between the so-called città storica, the historic city, and the città moderna, the modern city. It defines uh, the latter as the one that emerged with the Industrial Revolution. And in the specific case of Bologna, the report refers to uh, a plan, the, the 18, uh, 18 plan that you see here. In, we can clear, in, in which we can clearly see what is the clash that the report is talking about. It's really a clash of form, we can see, because it's really from the drawing, apart from the colors, there is really a matter of form. Regarding this clash, the report recognized the problem of centrality. The functions required by the modern city could not but partially find their place in the historical settings. Most of the functions, especially bureaucratic and commercial activities generating the movement of large masses of people, were completely incompatible with the ancient urban fab fabric and its uh, road network. The research therefore argued that it was necessary to preserve what remained of the historical center as a concrete testimony of past values that, in Rossi's term, we can read it as uh, to read the historical center as a unique urban artifact. Okay, I'm sorry, but this, uh, okay. As a approach uh, of an intervention, uh, as a um, approach of intervention, it counter the report counterposed uh, to the notion of sventramento, the one of risanamento conservativo. So the sventramento can be defined as the superimposition of a new urban form on the ancient urban structure. Is uh, just to be to be clear, is when uh, in the historical center. Uh, a, a part of the historical center gets demolished and that's completely replanned in order to accommodate a specific function with a specific form. To achieve uh, uh, these, uh, uh, these actions is, is done to achieve a sort of homogeneity between the two cities, between the modern city and the, and the historical cities. And we can see that is is an action that modifies the form according to a specific function that needs to be inserted in a specific urban pattern. On the contrary, the resignment conservativo reads the historical center as part of the modern city. Uh, is based on the heterogeneity among the two cities. 
and it's an approach that consists in looking for the right function that fits a specific form. What has been known as benevolence proposal was an approach that read the historical center as a unique urban artifact, proposed a classification of buildings into categories of intervention based on their historical and artistic character as well as cultural values, and suggested an analysis of the possible function that fit the existing form. The second contribution was the photographic survey that was conducted by Paolo Monti. The survey consisted of a detailed photographic reportage of the city center, excluding car and any contemporary road sign. So we can really see how the council was committed into this, uh, uh, into this project because they basically closed the entire city center uh, to the cars and they remove uh, all the road sign. And they did that as a means to build a social consensus in the reading of the historical center as a unique urban artifact rather than a collection of monuments. And in these photos, we can really see this uh, continuity and this reading that uh, the report was suggesting. Third, uh, the socioeconomic analysis. Uh, the socioeconomic analysis of the 1971 condition uh, was done to understand who was living in the historic center and which was the socioeconomic environment to be preserved. Among the many data collected, uh, the report highlighted, the analysis highlighted that almost 80% of the inhabitants of the historical center were tenants, many of whom were, were retirees, and that a large majority of them were artisans or employees. Fourth, and last, the uh, extensive archival research that suggested a typological approach. So this research has been made on the basis of an understanding of the historical center as the outcome of a unitary process framed by the aggregation of morphological entities that led to the actual form of the city. The archival research demonstrates how housing represents the analytical constant of the architecture of the city. That is to say that is the house, the element that unifies the urban pattern. This notion is strengthened by the same representation of housing typologies throughout the centuries. Historic architectural drawings always show the ground floor plan and sometimes even the first floor in a manner that depicts the diverse housing function in a conventional and descriptive way. These planning drawings are also joined by axonometric ones that detail construction techniques and material that reinforce the concept of inhabited space. And we really need that we, the extensive archival research really showed how the city center, I mean, in the archive, you really, they really found that the entire city center drawn in many different uh, way and in many different years uh, and, uh, and version. But there is this constant of uh, ways of representation that gives really a uh, unity to the entire, uh, to the entire urban pattern. So the, it was the material itself that suggested a typological approach. Based on an understanding of typology as the perseverance of ways of living and behaving that takes place in similar and recurrent buildings, and consisted of the study of how people have been living in the same houses over the previous centuries. The, typolo the typological research established four main categories of buildings in which the urban pattern of the historical center was composed. The category A that we see in this uh, map uh, is in the in a dark uh, red are the big containers, the, which are mainly the monasteries, uh, the former monasteries and cloisters. The category B in red orange, uh, the courtyard building where the aristocracy and high bourgeois used to live. The category C, the artisan house that we see in the blue, that really covers the fringe of the suburban uh, Roman roads. They were the workers' housing. And the category D, the bourgeois house with a small courtyard where the medium to low bourgeois uh, used to live. There are the one in yellow, orange. The uh, study analyzed also the association of each typology over time, really coming out with this uh, uh, scheme that are really um, rich in their composition. 
So the plan was advertised as an ancient city for a new society. That, that, is, uh, that they really defined the approach of the risanamento conservativo that we can translate as a conservative uh, um, restoration of the city center. That meant uh, adapting uh, the type to contemporary needs. In, in this way, giving to the ecology a political role, the one of stopping the process of gentrification of the historical center, maintaining the social cultural env environment. On this basis, the plan highlighted 13 comparti to be restored in order to host elderly people, students, and young couples, in addition to the people already living in the area, avo avoiding their removal. Uh, the comparti are defined as morphologically and functionally consistent sub areas and are the real object of the low income housing plan. Each one of the comparti follows this scheme. And it was composed by uh, in gray. We see the in gray, the, the, black, I mean, the, the, the big blocks that are the type C housing blocks. They were the former merchants and artisans uh, uh, housing uh, typologies. And then in, in black, the big containers belonging to the category A, so the former monasteries and cloisters, they would have worked in a complementary way. I will start from the housing and then I will, uh, I will explain the, the role of the big containers. So the artisan houses form these elongated rectangular blocks in which the voids used to prevail on the built environment. This typology reveals a sophisticated system in which the streets are flanked by arcades and create an architectural continuum with the presence of hidden gardens acting as squares that are accessible from the main roads through the arcades and through the, uh, the doors of the, uh, of the house. This system suggests a very particular relationship to, uh, in between the public uh, space and private ones so that are the, ga the gardens that are in the, interior of, uh, in the interior of the blocks. This typology has therefore been studied in all its association that happen over time. And starting from that, and in order to adapt the original form to contemporary needs, the plan proposed a new internal configuration of the house and the following split of, uh, of, the, of this system into apartments located at different level. This is a before and after of uh, uh, the ground floor of one of the, of the blocks that is the San Leonardo one. The ground floor was to host uh, public services in the front, so close to the arcade, this area here, um, and uh, usually a uh, private service like uh, a laundry room uh, uh, in, in the back, that is the one that uh, is connected to the, uh, to the garden. Or in, uh, instead of, uh, of this uh, private, let's say, service room, one uh, uh, 35 to 45 square meter apartments for students or uh, elderly people. The first floor was to host two 34 to 45 square meter apartments for students of elderly people. The third floor was either to host a 60 to 9 square meter apartment for young couples or a, a duplex of 130 180 square meter as a more standard size family apartment. To explain and share the aims and objective of the project with the citizens, the architects decided to use the same style of drawing found in their archive. The choice of making the axonometric drawings to represent each apartment time, for instance, was one way to underline the main characteristic of the space as being inhabited. While showing a simple morphology, because really we are talking about a very simple, very simple house, each apartment type is nevertheless drawn by the richness of detail suggestive of a, or a, life, of a, of a life snapshot. The furniture is different in each apartment, Tables are covered with uh, pen, books, and food. Pillows are different textiles, and curtains show different patterns in a clear attempt to defeat uh, the concept of standardization that was so public before. But the plan acted as a political project whose main aim was to propose a new idea of society that understands the minimum dwelling not as a means of building speculation, but rather as the basic space needed for basic functions that are complementary to collective space. 
And here I arrive on the second part of the project that is the one that uh, involves the big containers. From this perspective, while the dwelling unit provided only the minimum amount of private space, it was counterbalanced by a satisfying number of common spaces and social services scattered throughout the historical center and invited by the big containers, the former monasteries and cloisters. The renovation of the abandoned monastery, monasteries classified in the A category. To set an example, the San Leonardo Sant'Orsola complex was born at the 13th century church before subsequently becoming, becoming the monastery of the Orsolini nuns. At the end of the 18th century, it expanded through the acquisition of many vegetable garden areas, and then by the mid 20th century, the complex turned into a school and an hospital, which resulted in shrinking it into a squared form. Under the proposed renovation, uh, the project consisted of converting the main church into a theater and the small interior church together with the dining room and the courtyard into a gym, a facility linked to the pre-existing school but open to all. The proposed complex would also house the neighborhood civic center with rooms dedicated to meetings, free time, health center, exhibition, library, etc. and students' accommodation. In the case of Bologna, conservative restoration meant the social conservation as well as civic reappropriation of the city. This happened to the understanding of the historical center as a unique urban artifact, challenging that characteristic of the urban artifact well described by Rossi, that highlights the multiplicity of functions that a building can contain over time and how these functions are entirely independent from the form. In terms of planning, that means the implementation of a typological approach. Understanding typology as the perseverance of way of living and behaving that takes shape in similar and recurrent buildings. To conclude, the typological approach adopted for the conservative restoration of the historical center of Bologna represented the key tool of a big political project that was to propose a praxis, a way to link collective needs to economy and uh, collective needs and economy to architecture and urbanism, whose practice tends to be used for the exploitation of the working class rather than in their support. Typology is here a tool that expresses the link between form, function, and social classes. In this case study, the historical center is part of a bigger city project and is read as a balanced system whose form is worth being preserved while its functions have to be adapted to current society supporting and fostering the socioeconomic composition of the area. In the end, we can say that this praxis, this process of social conservation, is the act through which architecture represented a powerful tool of anti-capitalistic reappropriation of the city. Thank you. Thank you, Enrica, for this uh, very interesting presentation. And um, I think uh, to me, this is uh, very much uh, um, explaining an aspect of the fifth typology that I think is very important, which is the relationship between type uh, as an architectural project and policy making. Um, I think policy making uh, is uh, an extremely important uh, aspect of the project of the city, um, which uh, was, uh, you know, which is still actually going on. I mean, I, I think that the idea that there is no, that the, the cities actually grow in a kind of self-organizing fashion is not, uh, um, is not true, and the market itself actually is supported by by policies. So in a way, uh, cities are are always planned, uh, whether for the social good or for the market. That's of course the big uh, uh, question. But uh, policy making actually remains as one of the fundamental aspects uh, that really um, uh, formalize the city. And you showed to us how uh, Urbanistica Reformista, especially the work of Campos Venuti, was really able to tackle the urban dynamics uh, of, of the city, but still propose actually a, a clear architectural strategy. And, and, and I think that's for me the, the value of this uh, experiment. I mean, my question is uh, what happened after? Uh, you know, it was the project uh, implemented uh, or I mean, what, what was the... Uh, the, the result. <laughs> I don't know why people are laughing. There's no, no. 
But anyway, um, no, the project, as I, as I mentioned, started as a project of 13 uh, comparti, while in the end uh, they applied the uh, low income housing uh, a plan only on five of them out of 13. So it means already, I mean, how this kind of project are really hard to get to the final, to the very, very final stage. What is really interesting is that the really the commitment of these uh, uh, administrators uh, that is really hard to define them as technicians or politicians because the two things are really uh, intertwined. Uh, the commitment of them didn't stop in their in their office, but they were the first uh, going around in the city center, convinced convincing also the workers living in the city center that work uh, continue living in the city center, and so that uh, they they had to bring them uh, on their side because of course there were a lot of interest. Uh, uh, on the city center by investors and private properties, while the administration had to convince uh, the workers living in the city center to say that they wanted to stay in order to act and to uh, to and to invest and I mean for the council to invest uh, in keeping them there. And so it we really I mean there are lots of writings of Campos Venuti that describe how. They had to go around in the historical center to talk with the with the workers. So that like these meetings that ended up in the many trattorias and so on. And it's really there is this part of being an architect and being a politician that is really uh, I think uh, important. And it's uh, and is the reason why this uh, this project this exception as it has been described by another architect uh, a few years uh, later lasted uh, just the time uh, of that uh, administration and then of course uh, uh, if uh, without a political strong political support and without a strong political uh, commitment uh, uh, it uh, was completely lost if not by i mean yeah that is it Hello. Uh, Enrica, thank you for the presentation. It was great. I didn't know at all about this project, so it's uh, really interesting to see and um, beautiful to see both the pictures and the, yeah. the drawings. Um, I had a question uh, about the property. Like, you didn't uh, speci specify, but it seems to me and nowadays it would be almost impossible to even imagine a, a project like that, that enters in each unit establishing this kind of typological aspect because of the property issue. What, what was the idea in terms of the regime? Okay, we have to, I mean, yeah, I didn't, uh, I didn't bring this in because it would have made the presentation really, really long. But since you're asking, so basically this, the condition of the city center before this intervention was, were really, really poor. I mean, the condition of the housing and so on. So the city center really needed uh, our, I mean, regeneration or restoration uh, intervention. Uh, this, the, the council in that moment, uh, decided to invest a lot of money in the city. I mean, we're talking about, I mean, I'm really bad with numbers, but like it's something that is unprecedented as the amount of money that the Council of Bologna put in the expropriation. I mean, it, there is even this thing that in that moment in time in Italy, there was this law, the expropriation law that allowed the council, so the, I mean, the state in general, the public to, to, to buy uh, private properties uh, at the cost of the agricultural value of uh, the land. That back then so was uh, quite convenient, but still uh, uh, the Council of Bologna expropriated a huge amount of pieces of land really close to the city center uh, for housing purposes. Something that he, um, they uh, succeeded in doing also for part of uh, the city center, so the historical center. For example, uh, if we see this map. Uh, Although that, that was only for the region of Emilia-Romagna. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I'm talking because of Bologna, of the case of Bologna. It's important to say that that law of, uh, um, that uh, you expropriate and you pay the expropriated, the, the price of 
It was actually proposed in the 1960s as a national law, but it was actually rejected. Uh, and only actually uh, Emilia Romagna and a few other red uh, regions were able to do that. Yeah, it's even there is even another discourse that like they interpreted the expropriation law in a uh, in a particular way that allowed them to buy these uh, uh, pieces of land in order to build housing. But this is making this thing really, 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 really long. While, for example, in this case, I think they succeeded in the expropriation of the two blank areas that are the two areas that were completely bombarded during bombed during the Second World War. So those parts they expropriated. While the other ones they uh, proposed that. Deal with private properties, and basically the state paid for the refurbishment of uh, the housing, while uh, the private property uh, committed to a special uh, price, a special rent to the uh, um, uh, people uh, renting the apartment uh, uh, restored, uh, refurbished. So there was this kind of dealing between the state and the property, something that at a certain point with. Uh, neoliberalism and so on of course to stop <laughs> but yeah the this is something which like the, the council really worked uh, on this kind of uh, uh, special agreement in between uh, uh, owners and uh, people renting the apartment or finding a low price of uh, renting properties and so on. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, thank you, Enrique, for this really interesting presentation. Maybe you can, yeah, you can stay on this slide. I think that, as David has said, the images and the drawings are super beautiful and interesting. And maybe this is a question for you, but also for other people that uh, spoke today, because I think that because it's a political project, and as you say, type and function, form and social class, I think that these drawings, these um, cinematic or perspectival sec um, plans are much more legible um to people that are non-architects than plants and in this case we have photographs and these kind of axonometric plants that are very <clears throat> communicative um and i wonder this of course was a political civic project and that's why it was important to make it with this kind of playful drawings to make it so more people can understand it and if the issue of typology the notions the thing that we're discussing today are they making architecture more or less accessible beyond um, our own profession? Because I think that what Pierre Vittorio did today, he managed to bring practitioners and scholars together to discuss this, the same things. But my question is, will, will someone who is not an, an architect that usually can understand architecture through pictures, let's say through images um, that are visually seductive, can we make through typology um architecture more accessible or actually less because just these words you know it's like typology it can be already quite uh, distancing people from understanding it or maybe there's a way to make a vocabulary that is more communicative let's say on the, on the one end uh, i have to say that this drawing has been done uh, precisely for uh, the people that would have uh, had to go back uh, to this uh, house because I mean you have to imagine that really uh, the restoration happened uh, to units that were uh, inhabited so they had to build in this case for example in this case they built uh, actually for they started building the new blocks where they put like uh, uh, the people living nearby during the time of the restoration of the building. So they had some time to convince the people that were living there that were worth uh, uh, staying and doing all this moving, not to go to the peripheries, not to go to the new apartment typologies like elsewhere, but to continue living in the city center in a certain way. And they didn't know how their house would have looked like. And uh, the, uh, anyway, it, it was anyway a big change because uh, they split the, the housing apartment. So anyway, the, the change was there. But at the same time, they worked on the same structure. So to me, on the other end, uh, while they had to convince them with these drawings in order to show them that these places were already inhabited, like really these drawings are representing uh, yeah, a life snapshot. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there was the familiarity of the people living there with a certain kind of structure. That is the the end, the arcade, the entrance, the garden internally. So 
there was, I mean, it, there, there are these two parts. So data, data typology to me work in a positive way in this sense mm -hmm. that you, you really, they, they, these, these uh, technicians, let's say, uh, were able to demonstrate, even especially with these uh, drawings here, that there is a structure that belongs to the private and to the public at the same time, that belongs both to the city and to the inhabitants. Uh, that is really, these are drawings that were made by the, in, in the 1960s. So, and to me, the typology is somehow here more than in the interior of the loom, is in the structure that connects uh, the city and uh, the way of living. You know, I had a, a follow up question on this because um, I mean, I think when, when one speaks about typology, I think it's always the tension between continuity and change. What establishes, you know, what is recognized as, as a value that is worth pers um, perpetuating and uh, and what are what is the degree acceptable of uh, of of change and uh, and in the drawings one sees a lot this desire for for formal continuity right like the width of the plots um many of the aspects that you were showing now in these perspectives and the arcades um but then i was also interested when you were describing more about the social fabric you know you were speaking about young couples students so my question is if there is a clear commitment for continuity in terms of form, um, was there a more flexible understanding of the change in the social fabric, which was of course different than the one to which this form was planned on the first place? So yeah, yeah, this, I... this is exactly the point of this project. Basically, what they did is like they did an, an analysis to basically recognize uh, how what is the working class today. Yes. No, I mean yes. these uh, these uh, these these. Uh, this typology has been built uh, ages before where the working class was different. Mm -hmm. Today we have a different working class that is composed, is more, uh, let's say, diverse because it's composed by students, first of all, that are the working class in Bologna because Bologna has a giant university and in the 60s they were really the working class, or at least it was what they were claiming to be. So uh, young couples, of course, and artisans and the elderly people, because even elderly people and the retirees, uh, there were a lot, that analysis showed that there were a lot of retired, uh, retired people living in the, and so they were part of a social, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, a social uh, pattern, let's say, of the city. And this the relationship between form and function is, is evident in this, uh, in this drawing, that the form is something that belongs to the urban artifacts, let's say, the bigger urban artifacts, but still uh, we have to adapt to the current uh, needs of the society. No, and that's why I think in that way is how interp I interpret the, um, the intensity of uh, furniture drawing, because basically how I read this is, okay, we are consistent with the form that perhaps everyone is familiar with, mm -hmm. but we are putting a new life. Yes. Uh, therefore, that's what makes the change yeah, exactly. evident yet the consistency in the form. So I think it's perfect. I think yeah. there is a, an important point that perhaps uh, should be about this uh, uh, permanence of form and change of use. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and that's actually the link to, to Rossi. Uh, at that time, there was this uh, idea that for us, maybe today sounds conservative, uh, but at the time in the uh, leftist uh, milieu was considered, on the contrary, the progressive way to develop cities. That basically, uh, the historic city compared to the modern city is more. I mean, I, I shouldn't use this word flexible. In, in other words, that was Rossi's critique to functionalism. Mm -hmm. The problem of functionalism yeah. is that produce a city that is too specific. Mm -hmm. So when the social uh, condition change, the city is not able to absorb that change. Well, actually, there was a belief that the historic city, um, the Western, let's say, or Italian historic city, had, um, like the Palazzo della Ragione, for example, had. Uh, room uh, enough for uh, change. I mean, in a way, using Christophe's um, remark, uh, it's an, the historic city was a, a, had a sustainability of form. I mean, yeah. it was mm -hmm. unlike the modern city that was too bespoke to certain functions, uh, the, the, the historic city had this um, uh, capacity uh, to have new uh, forms, new, new life. 
Uh, and uh, um, the idea of preservation was understood uh, by Rossi, but also by Campos Beruti, as a resistance to real estate, um, let's say, mm -hmm. takeover, which was happening in many cities where real estate was very powerful, like Rome, for example, convincing uh, people to sell uh, big uh, patches of, of land and destroying and rebuilding with uh, much more density in order to to make money. So in a way, this is actually very interesting that uh, conservation here uh, was uh, an act of political uh, challenge. While for us today, right. conservation has become uh, synonymous of, of a conservative uh, mindset. Yes. Yeah. Thank you uh, for the presentation. I also love the drawings and I have a special affection or uh, adoration for the city of Bologna myself. Um, so it's exciting to learn about this project. So I would have three questions, but two in is linked, so short questions. Um, the, I mean, first of all is um, uh, because because as far as I know, there are also these neighborhoods like San Donato, et cetera, in, built in the 70s, no? in, like, because I was thinking Il Corviale, this Fiorentino project, and also housing the, the people living at the periphery, or putting them also in the periphery, like a limit uh, between city and the, um, the agricultural areas. So, because when you were um, uh, mentioning about the master plan 73, you mentioned that there were the containers. So I don't know if, if it's, it's my ignorance, but I was wondering, what you mean by that, or were there, were there, was there at the same time an attempt by, by the city uh, to um, to plan these areas like San Donato, etc. It was like, what is it, uh, parallel at the same time. This yeah. was happening at the same time, right? And then it's a bit, it's a bit, uh, it's curious because uh, one is exactly really keeping the city center, but for the work class mm -hmm. or for the current residents. And also the project to build at the periphery huge housing areas again social housing, no? Because um, I don't. I, I I was trying to check which were the dates of this Il Corviale and all these projects and in Bologna. So maybe if it's part of the same plan, so then um, this is kind of a controver controversial state or what? And the second question is um, is related to this issue of real estate because. When, when when we think about this architect as technocrat or technician and politician at the same time, and it, in this case is a left wing uh, whatever city, and then when they were proposing this as a not, not conservative, let's say as as PV uh, saying uh, progressive development, so were they how they were coping with the real estate, like proposing areas at the periphery, or this is also another question because it's you know I. It, Architect is kind of an intermediary agent always. And if these architects, this team were um, commissioned by the, 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 um, the city of Bologna is another thing, or if they were working within the, within the city of Bologna is another thing, I think. I don't know if I could explain. So, yeah, okay. so, took... so let's put a little bit of order in the thing. So the plan of Bologna is a plan of the 1970s. Now it's a, it's a big plan in which uh, uh, you see how there is uh, inside the plan, uh, there is the uh, low, how, low income housing uh, for the city of Bologna plan. That is the one that basically um, highlights certain areas within the city of Bologna where to uh, implement housing uh, complexes. And these uh, housing complexes, part of the low housing uh, uh, program, were uh, basically both uh, the, the pieces of land were bought by the council through the expropriation law in order to build these uh, uh, these housing complexes. And in, these are case studies that then uh, I mean we can talk for another hour I guess about this thing. But like the the good thing is that they they succeeded in achieving a, a really great. Uh, um, amount of uh, um, public services, square meters per person. This is the most outstanding, uh, let's say, uh, uh, notion of these housing complexes. Then to the city center, they try to apply the same uh, policy. 
the law uh, income housing program. Of course, it was different because it was not building from scratch. It was like a, to deal with uh, the uh, historical, to, to, to an existing urban pattern, and therefore whatever we uh, said. Uh, the big containers that you were mentioning, the big containers uh, are basically is the name that they give uh, to a typology within the city center that are the former monasteries and cloister. But then uh, this kind of reality that is, uh, is the civic center. So basically it's a big building that inside has uh, space for free time for the citizen, student housing, the gym, the school, uh, uh, medical um, facilities uh, and so on. So it's this kind of uh, reality that then you, you find again in the new neighborhoods uh, out of the historical center with the name normal of civic center. And that is really an innovation of uh, the, the Bologna administration. But of course, uh, since the modern city is different rather than the historical center, they have two different names. But I mean, they try to apply the same concept to the two cities, let's say. Thank you. And then I, I now realize that Bologna project is kind of pioneering uh, Icor Viale or similar projects because they were in the 70s and now it's 63 in this plan they force so kind of this peripheral housing yeah. development. Anyway. Yeah, that probably is a bit too much to say it's Bologna no, experience. Icor uh, Viale was part of a social housing uh, but it's part of the most plan again, no? Of, of no, no. Actually, the social housing uh, in there were different kinds of social housing policies in Italy at that time. Corviale is part of a law that allowed the municipalities to buy land and to build uh, big housing, uh, social housing. The problem was that uh, in the case of the Roman municipality, um, there was less radicality in finding a good uh, spot for social housing because, uh, of course, land costs a lot. Uh, and uh, uh, so the, the, the municipality tend to buy land that is very far away from the city center because it's cheaper. Corvia actually is an, has an interesting uh, 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 footnote to that. The land of that humongous uh, project belonged to the family of the architect, Mario Fiorentino. Who was a, a, coming from a, a landowner family, but Fiorentino was a communist architect. So he decided to uh, donate for free the land to the municipality. But of course, he uh, got the project. <laughs> <laughs> but in this case, this is actually a, a more radical because, in fact, the people that went to stay in Corviale were people coming from the city center of Rome, which was being heavily gentrified. And so People were often removed from the city center to the periphery. So this is almost like a response to that. Project. This is a response. This is actually a unique case where uh, social housing uh, was implemented in the city center without destroying uh, mm -hmm. the historical city. Yeah, and the decision of the council of Bank. Yeah, so yeah. I thought that it happened in the case of Bologna, the social housing sites at the same time. At the same time, the historic center. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you uh, so much. <laughs> Thank you.